Hello, and welcome to another Fluidform Research Highlight. Our guest today is Iman Mirdamadi. Iman received his bachelor's degree in chemistry from George Washington University in 2016, a master's degree in biomedical engineering from Carnegie Mellon University in 2020, and is currently a PhD student in bioengineering at the University of Maryland. Today, Iman will be discussing his work on the paper, Fresh 3D Bioprinting, a full-size model of the human heart published in ACS Biomaterials in October of 2020. Now this work has gone on to get a tremendous amount of media attention and even made the cover of the ACS Biomaterials journal. Here to describe what this means for the future of 3D bioprinting is Iman Mirabadi. All right, Iman, thank you for joining us. You, you too. Yeah. I think we're, yeah, we're back now. Okay. So first of all, congratulations. First author paper. That's, uh, that's always a big deal. Um, so can you at least like begin uh, with just like a really brief like 30 second overview of this publication that was in ACS Biomaterials? Yeah, sure. And first off, thanks so much for having me on, Andrew. Yeah, so, thanks for coming. Yeah, so the first this paper that we recently published hallmarks the ability of this platform on this freeform reversible embedding of suspended hydrogels to print at large scales and more notably organ scales. Now, unlike other platforms, what Fresh allows you to do is print with soft biological materials that are also biocompatible, which brings about implications for bioengineering research. But with respect to the applications of this paper, because we're using a material that's generally used for, um, to have like the soft compliant properties, we were hallmarking and using the applications of this material for surgical training and simulation applications. And because the material is low cost, it allows us to basically play around with parameters more quickly to get us to the desired shapes that we want. So what was the, the design process of going from like, just like even the thought of, I want big soft heart to actually getting it. Like what were like the, the major design and engineering checkpoints that like you knew that this was a major milestone along the way to actually get to where you, you ended up. Yeah. So I think the majority of the problems came about the hardware. While the previous master student that came, um, many know from uh, previously, her name was Kira. She published the first iteration of the large volume extruder printer that uh, we can go about talking about a little later. Yeah. There were some fundamental limitations on that printer that did not allow for the building of full scale organs. Now that doesn't mean that you can't print, you know, organs that are a bit smaller with that setup. But if you really wanted to get something at a true human scale, there were not only size limitations, but also innate hardware limitations that won't allow the printer to go beyond a certain amount of time and do so viably. Gotcha. And when you say you say organs, um, I think this is always like a big clarification that always needs to be made is like the difference between a an organ that's naturally already in the body versus a tissue that is being engineered outside the body versus an organ model or a scaffold can you go into like the differences and and what exactly like you printed versus what uh like exists in the body uh, natively and so on sure so alginate is known at least in the field of tissue engineering to be biocompatible that does not necessarily mean it's an ideal candidate to be used for transplantation some of its properties are advantageous from a more mechanical sense, but actually getting those mechanical properties to have advantages at full organ scales is not really the most practical thing to do, considering the number of biological cells you would need to get something to be functional to that scale. So the reason why most of the applications we were catering this uh, publication to were for surgical training and planning was simply because that that's where the technology is. And also considering the amount of time that it took to print something like that doesn't really make this technology really right now practical from a transplantation sense, if you will. And you mentioned surgical planning, which I think is a huge element of this paper. Can you speak to the like the power and what it's going to mean for doctors like five, ten years from now to be able to use this type of three D printing in medicine in general? Yeah. So one of the biggest problems with a lot of the uh, the surgical models that I've seen is that they consist of very hard materials. And these materials, while they allow, allow the surgeons to see the internal anatomy of even very patient spe uh, very specific and precise patient-specific models, if you'd wanna simulate on a procedure with a hard construct, it'd be quite difficult, particularly for procedures such as suturing or doing dynamic surgical simulations. What Fresh allows you to do is develop constructs de novo 
that are not only now at the proper scale, but with a versatile material set that allows you to gain compliance from these materials, elasticity, and also get the same feeling as that of native organ structures. So, so you, use that the, you use the acronym uh, FRESH. Can you describe what's going on there? I know that a lot of Fluid Forum revolves around FRESH and maybe people who are watching this are familiar with it, but for someone who's just tuning in for the first time, um, can you speak to what FRESH is, what it does, enables? Sure. So FRESH stands for Freeform Reversible Embedding of Suspended Hydrogels. And the very basis of that technology is the ability to print a pretty much a liquid and turn it into a solid within a bath of material that contains a chemical that converts your ink into this solid. So most of the people that are probably watching this might be familiar with fused deposition model, where the uh, premise of it is that you can take a plastic filament that forms a molten and can layer by layer deposit to form your solid construct. Fresh works more or less in a similar manner, except as opposed to starting with a solid, you're starting actually with a liquid. And the liquid in the syringe, once it's deposited in a hydrogel bath, allows for its solidification based on the materials and chemicals that are within that hydrogel bath. Now, more notably, is the fact that this bath has this property known as a big in plastic. It's a fancy word for basically what mayonnaise and ketchup do, <laughs> where if you apply force onto this bath, it basically forms into a liquid. And that liquid state allows needles to travel through it as it's depositing ink to enable this conversion of a liquid bioink into a solid bioink, thereby being in somewhat similarities to uh, the fused deposition modeling. Gotcha. Can can you describe the like the general printer setup? Like if I were to walk in the lab, like what would I see? Would it be this thing that needs it's an like an entire room to itself? Um, can or is, does this just like fit on a like a little uh, desktop or or study table? Um, like what what type of like system are you looking at to use this? Yeah, so believe it or not, to actually get this uh, part to work, we used a very old printer from a, a company known as PrinterBot, and we modified it so that it could enable bioprint. Um, as I talked before, this printer was actually modified first by a previous master student in the lab, in which I had to further modify to develop this organ scan print. Um, so basically, the printer is the size of probably a school desk. It contains a large syringe, but what's more important about this setup is that it's a bowed and setup. Now, for those that are not familiar with a Bowden setup, the only thing that differentiates it from your typical fused deposition modeling printer is that all the motors and your, I guess, instead of filaments, your syringe, are away from the printer itself, as opposed to directly on the printer head. For large-scale prints, this provides the unique advantage of not having all the weight exerted on the extruder head, which provides the travel motions. Those travel motions, the lighter you make that setup, the easier it can be to print and move your um, print head of, of whatever um, setup you have. Yeah, it's really interesting that you can print something that is almost the same like size as the printer, <laughs> where there's very little wasted space. Um, about the LVE, how does uh, this LVE, which stands for Large Volume Extruder, which you talk, it's like a huge piece in the paper that's like basically the name for the printer. Um, how does that differ from a more traditional bioprinter that someone's using right now in their lab, like in a Levy or a Cell Inc or an Envision Tech? Yeah, I touched on this a little bit, but again, it's that fundamental difference between the direct extruder heads versus the Bowden systems. And by hallmarking the properties of a Bowden extruder, you're moving all of the hardware or the extruder heads away from that needle. So a lot of the travel that occurs actually on the needle itself have a lot less weight, causing less disruptions during motions of travel. However, this does get offset when you're printing things that are large because you need a needle that's sufficiently large enough that does not deflect. However, because you move all of those components away from the needle head, you can make that needle as uh, stiff and large as you want so that you don't have any of those sort of perturbations as a result of travel motions. And I think by doing that, you're able to uh, get things at the scale that you could not do with a direct extruder head with a syringe directly next to the needle. Gotcha. I think a big part of the series that I like about uh, what we're trying to do with the research highlights is where we have the people who actually did the work say this is what had to be done that it's not necessarily going to make its way into the methods where when you're doing these prints, you see the resulting prints and they look great. What was the step to actually calibrate a printer in this manner to actually get it to use a much larger syringe, which comes with a lot of uh, unique challenges as opposed to a small 
Bridget glass syringe. How did you actually go about um, optimizing all these print settings? Because there's a lot when there's when you're talking about fresh. There's a lot of things, and you're dealing with a system that is is far different from say a 2.5 ml syringe. If you're doing these large and Bowdoin style systems. Yeah, I could probably go on about this for three, four hours <laughs> because every setting I could tell you what could be better or worse. But I'll probably tell you the most important one that bridged me from like doing really basic prints on this large volume extruder printer to the heart itself. And that was actually the retraction. So retraction was definitely the hardest thing to get optimized on this system because the fact that we not only have a syringe, we also have a lot of tubing that's connecting the syringe to that extruder head makes retractions a lot more difficult. And, you know, it's not necessarily a, a constant thing that has to happen back and forth. So to offset that issue where it was such a big problem, because over time, you know, we don't want to, I don't want to get too like technical, but the essential problem is that when you retract once and you extrude back, it doesn't always retract the same amount because that material has a little bit of a lag. Mm -hmm. So the simplest way I can explain of how I fix that was to change the speed by which the printer was traveling so that that movement of that alginate material would not have to catch up to the travels that occur. But there were many other things that I had to do to offset this sort of lag on the alginate. But I'd probably say that, you know, where one thing was a sort of an issue, you had to fix another. Yeah. And sort of collectively playing with these variables together till I got the print to work, allowed me to sort of move from smaller to larger to even now you had some really unique challenges when it comes to trying to print this, when it actually comes time to press print. Um, a huge thing that comes to mind is just the container that you need for this thing, and therefore the amount of mass or volume of fresh support bath that you actually need for it. What What is it like to actually try and get all that bath? What does it do? How like What makes it something more difficult? Uh, like What are the headaches and challenges with that? Yeah, I mean, Aside from just the, the, the sheer labor of, you know, fabric, like making all that bath material, and <laughs> putting it in a container, I would probably say the, you know, the biggest, one of the biggest challenges in printing something with that much volume bath is keeping it hydrated. So having a hydrogel bath at that sheer size has a large surface area on the top. And that surface area, if you don't have it contained in some enclosure, will dry really quickly. So, I mean, the most, you know, the most obvious thing to do is obviously constantly check on it and seeing that this was probably the last first time to print something this large. Um, I was basically always trying to constantly monitor this print. But of course, you can alternatively, and this is what I found out over, the, over time, um, because the print was traveling so slowly, you could always just add gelatin little by little as the print was occurring. But of course, the issue there is that, you know, let's say you want to sleep for eight hours and do this realistically. And you can't necessarily predict when that um, when the needle is always going to be within that gelatin. So I try to overcompensate with the amount of gelatin volume I put to make sure that we were always having the needle inside the gelatin. Yeah, I think uh, like for for the short term, just having a huge bucket of the support bath was absolutely necessary. I think it could be really cool if you think like five years in the future where you have a printer that has like a, a traditional FDM plastic head or something, and it can build the container up, you know, like maybe like an inch at a time, and then it has like a huge, like it's a another Bowdoin system that's just a massive amount of the support bath, and then it comes in with a really fat nozzle to like maybe deposit like a centimeter of support bath, and then it comes in with the ink that you want. So you are actually just building the entire system up as you go. Um, it could be really, really difficult, but a really neat way to print something huge. Um, but going back to the actual heart models that you're printing um, and how a lot of surgery is so far beyond just learning from textbooks and that you have to do a lot more hands-on training in hospitals to become a surgeon than just passing uh, written exams in med school. What is the process of testing things for suture retention and actually trying to get these to be more realistic tissue simulants? for surgical planning and training? Yeah, so that test that we did with the suture retention pullout was really important to say, this is why we're using alginate. Because since the fresh paper in 2015, there have been a lot of proof of printing with different materials and a lot of different materials have great advantages and disadvantages. So to prove that alginate indeed could be used for a situation of surgical simulation, let's see if we can pull it under a suture. And more importantly, can it actually pull out of that 
a construct, just like you would to not a, you know, a construct or a tissue. Now, one of the limitations right now with the alginate we use is this elasticity. While the alginate itself is innately stiff, the suture pullout allowed us to show that we can pull a suture through it and it doesn't collapse, because innately these alginate materials absorb water, and you think once you puncture it, it collapses, but it doesn't. Um, what we showed is that while we can pull a suture through it, that construct can actually maintain its shape. And then on top of that, by pulling it out, we can show that in theory, you could also develop these reliable knots, similar to that of um, sealing a wound in a um, incision. Gotcha. When you think about the future of this project, I guess you could truncate it into two, I guess, further time points of the next student to, to take on this project and use that printer versus maybe five to 10 years from now where you could have dozens of people doing something revolving around large volume fresh printing. What do you see for those two, two scenarios of like the next student versus a, a team in 10 years? Yeah, so sort of like where are the next steps if I did not mistake that question. Yeah, yeah. So I think a lot of it can come at least for short term immediate goal, immediate like mile step, milestones is a lot of the machinery improvements. So a lot of the bioprinters that are commercially out there or, you know, they can do amazing things with respect to creating cell laden constructs. But if we really want to talk about bringing the limitate, bringing, hitting the boundary of developing soft hydrogel constructs, the machinery in terms of the hardware of a printer needs to be innately approved. Not only in the sense of just speeding things up, but actually allowing for higher throughput ability to develop these constructs. Because, you know, it's one thing to just as proof of concept, and it's, you know, it's a very enthusiastic finding to be able to print this large scale organ. But also remember it took about 92 hours, which is four days. And I don't think surgeons can necessarily wait four days for a full scale heart to simulate a procedure, let alone a lot of these parts that I printed, even the coronary artery with that um, left ventricle took about a day. So, you know, most surgeons can't wait till the next day. You know, they wanna immediately have these constructs. So improving the speed, the only way to do that is to improve the hardware to allow for the ability of these Bowdoin systems, these Bowdoin-based bioprinters, to print at faster speeds. Number two is the actual ability to pr print with multiple materials. So there are techniques where you can actually change the infill density and the stiffnesses by innately changing the properties of the shape to create multiple fields. But the problem there is that you're gonna be altering the print times by just using a single material. So by using multiple materials allows you to reduce the amount of time to print co complex constructs with multiple fields across the uh, shape itself. And I think that would be very important to actually optimize over just, um, you know, a lot of what, what the field is wanting is just to cellularize <laughs> the said construct. Yeah, I think a big improvement to hardware, and I think a lot of the bioprinters out there do this, is they just don't have a moving bed, or if the bed moves, it only moves down in Z. Because I think a huge challenge with this was you talk about like a, a two liter support bath, which is absolutely massive. Most people are doing like five to 20 milliliters at a time. But if you have two liters of fluid, that's close to five pounds. And if the bed is moving and it tries to move quickly, it's just the potential for skipping is immense. And so just switching over to an XY gantry for any bioprinter alone would be fantastic and allow you to print way faster. And you combine that with doing a boat and like you said, you can just start flying around. Um, aside from just the hardware limitations, what would it be to actually try and print this out of maybe like collagen or cells? I think you touched on this in the very beginning as to why that's not feasible to do right now, but but why are those things not feasible? Because we have to keep reiterating that this is, a, this is a heart model. It's not something that can go immediately into somebody as if it has cells and is contracting um, with like the full force and, and pressure of a, of a native heart. Um, but what stops us from getting there right now? Well, so I think the first thing is going to be cost. And that's probably the easiest thing to uh, oversee. So I think people outside of research um, don't understand what it takes to get a lot of the materials that we use to print, you know, these kinds of constructs. I mean, alginate, the nice thing about alginate is that while it's bio biocompatible, and I say that more in the sense that it's been shown to allow for cell attachments, it's not as optimal as something like a natural ECM such as collagen. Now, a lot of the commercial collagen materials that are out there now have to be ultra purified to ensure that's the only thing you have in there. And so to get collagen to the stage that we can allow for bioprinting 
takes a lot of post-processing between the actual vendor to the middleman to a research lab or to anyone that actually wants to apply the development of a heart model to the scale. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I think five mLs of collagen can be two to three hundred dollars. So I, I can just disclose now that I mean this full scale heart print took about 60, 60 mils. So do the math there, and that's just the material alone. Now, with respect to actually creating this functionally, you have two major problems. Of course, it's the cell density where cells are already a huge cost within itself. But number two is also getting those cells to align, which to get those cells to align and mature is a whole other beast that goes beyond just printing them through a collagen um, construct. And while you know the last paper that was published in uh, Professor Adam Feinberg's lab kind of showed that at a smaller scale, the amount of cells you needed for that was already incredible. And so multiplying that to something this big can be a huge, just, you know, a huge mess. Now, number two is the fact that those cells have a limited viability capacity outside of a cell culture incubator. So if you, most of the commercial printers that are out there, you know, with respect to the fresh platform that uses gelatin, it's not feasible to print inside a cell culture incubator. And even still, the sheer forces that apply that are applied onto a through a needle on those cells kill the cells as they get extruded over time. So if you multiply that sort of death across 92 hours, you can see how the problems build up on that end as well. Yeah, I always get jealous whenever I just go grocery shopping. You can just see like pound. I can get like five pounds of chuck roast for ten bucks. And yet to even get a pinky amount of cells for especially stem cells could cost you thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, I always uh, will end this series on the same question, regardless of, of who's on, because it's always about 3D printing is if if I were a student uh, coming into either the Feinberg lab or really any lab right now getting into doing 3D printing, maybe I'm the first person to actually do it because my lab's expanding into this area. What pieces of a piece or pieces of advice would you give that student to try and make them as successful of a 3D bioprinter researcher as you could? Always be open to learning new things because fundamentally printing is going to be changing as fast as you're going to be learning things. And even as I'm seeing this printing field changing more and more, <laughs> even if you reach the precipice of even if you reach sort of the peak of your printing capabilities, there always, there's always someone else doing something completely different and maybe even better. And so opening yourself to seeing what's sort of at the forefront is important. And the only way to do that is just to have an open mind and be a really good student. Awesome. I think that's uh, a great piece of advice to, uh, to end on. Um, with that, thank you so much. Uh, love the paper. It's super cool to just hold a full heart in someone's hand uh, and with that, uh, thank you so much. Yeah. And again, thanks for having me on, Andrew. Great, man. All right. We'll see you later. Thanks for watching this research highlight. We hope you found it useful. Leave a like or a comment below so that other researchers can find research and work like this. Thanks.